Okay, thank you, Jane. So you know there was um, a great writer, Gore Vidal, that said, it's not enough for me to win. Everybody I know has to lose. So th that's about being really aggressive. But anyway, <clears throat> cancer is an interesting area. A good deal of the drugs that are being developed and have been developed that are novel were developed in the cancer field for a number of reasons. Back at the turn of the last century, at the turn of the last century, Halstead, who was one of the founders of uh, uh, Johns Hopkins and who did the first, who wore rubber gloves, who did the first inguinal surgery, and who did the first uh, radical mastectomy, taught us that even if you did a rad radical mastectomy rather early, a cell had already metastasized and killed the patient, and that's what we had to deal with. A little later, but not much later, a couple of years later, there was a man who watched a, a, a patient, a young boy, die with osteosarcoma. He freaked out and he tried to figure out something that he could do that was novel, because this was in, around 1900. And that was William Cooley at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And what he did was inject a couple of bacterial toxins into the tumor, and it cured that patient. The very first one he tried it on didn't always work. But what it showed him was that the immune system might be important. And that was rather cool. When I was at the NCI, what was fascinating, and, and uh, 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 you know, we, we, we funded a million studies that had to do with immunity or the ability to uh, create a vaccine for cancer. This was in the 70s and 80s, and they were doing a million of those studies. They all failed. Everything failed. What we didn't realize, and what Bill Cooley didn't realize, is that the immune system looked at cancer cells as if they were self. And if you had self, you had Tregs down-regulating the immune system to those antigens. It was rare that the cancer cell was different enough from uh, self that you made an immune response to it. In fact, some people thought that there were lots of cancer cells like that always, and the normal immune system cleared them. And then periodically, it didn't. But what's really interesting is that we didn't learn about those Tregs for a very long time, about 100 years. So it was very difficult. And then suddenly, we made drugs like anti pdl one and anti-PD-1, which changed the world. And you know, uh, uh, Dr. Nicholson here did it when he was at Organon with Keytruda. And interesting, uh, uh, Elise isn't here. And Alan Corman, you know, Allison won the Nobel Prize. Is Allison here? I'm, I'm being facetious. He was one of the people that didn't deserve the Nobel Prize. There were other people that did deserve it, like Friedman, who didn't get it. Did you like that, Andy? Well, I, did you check to see if he was here or not? No. <laughs> you know I didn't. What's very, very interesting is Alan Corman at Metarex with Optivo and, and Yervoy and et cetera did beautiful work, and then when Bristol got a hold of it, they tried to do clinical trials to get rid of chemotherapy. They really wanted to do that. Merck didn't have that luxury for a number of reasons, and Elise Ryson showed uh, with just chemo and a good biomarker that she made, she did a better clinical trial than with Keytruda, I mean with Optivo. So Keytruda won. Right now Merck sells about $20 billion worth of Keytruda a year. More, more. 28, you know, I, I was last year. And, and what Bristol does is sell about $5 billion worth of Optivo. Same bloody drug. 
same drug. And, you know, and yet, we learn in the world that it's really interesting how clinical trials are done. And we'll learn in the future a lot more about clinical trials. Nijat and Dina, who are out there, taught me to be really circumspect about how machine learning is used and what it's used for. I have a different view of a lot of other people, but it's going to be very, very interesting. At any rate, um, we've got a group to talk about cancer. And Cooley's vaccine, Cooley, in 1900, got an immune response in a lot of uh, uh, people. Not enough, and he didn't understand what a cancer vaccine could do. So that was very interesting. And by the way, we live in a new world. We live in a world of immunotherapy. We live in a world of ADCs that have changed. You know, what, what uh, uh, Jose Baselga and Antoine Iver understood was that very quickly was that their ADC against HER2 could hit about five cell, five molecules of HER2 and change the world for ADCs which was very interesting. Matai Mammon understood when he was head of R&D at J&J, he's now not at an interesting company anymore. <laughs> and what he understood very quickly was that the deal he did with Legend changed the world of, of uh, myeloma therapy. Fascinating. And what we have now is people living longer and longer and longer with diseases where they were dead in six months, if they were lucky, long before. So the world's changed. And Bruce and I were at the NCI. He's older than I am. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Sure. He's probably not. And he just looks older. <laughs> <laughs> at any rate. Hey, Sam, how many push-ups can you do? Uh, oh, a hundred. A hundred right now. <laughs> just so we know. At any rate, uh, uh, what's very interesting is that the world of cancer therapy has changed. And, uh, you know, we saw someone wearing KRAS uh, socks. What we have to understand is that it, when I developed Herbitox, I thought it was going to kill everything, but it only killed when, the wild, when it was wild-type KRAS. When there was a mutant, which was there all over the place, EGF receptor didn't work didn't work if uh, SARC was activated. So we now know that in order to make the KRAS uh, a small molecule interesting for, uh, for, for Bristol, he said you have to use an anti-EGF receptor with it. And when you do, you will change the amount of patients that you save. Very interesting. So we now have a great panel to talk to us about the future. I could talk for hours. I have to talk, to let the panel talk. So uh, would everybody introduce themselves and quickly? I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm Sam's friend from the National Cancer Institute. I was there for 27 years. I guess it's longer than you, Sam. I, for sure. I'll last at you. Um, they wanted me in other and, places. Uh, yeah, my field is in cancer drug development, and it was there, and I came to Mass General about 26 years ago. You can add all that up and figure out how old I am. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's been exciting. Uh, first involved in chemotherapy development and at MGH, more involved in targeted drugs, and now CAR-T and antibodies. And uh, so it's a marvelous change for the, the field. Yeah. Hello. I'm Zandi Forbes, and I run a genetic medicines business. We hadn't really focused on cancer at all. Uh, we did some gene replacement in the eye. We do local delivery for... Um, changing circuitry in the brain in Parkinson's so you don't need dopamine, those sorts of deliveries for um, gene therapies that aren't uh, gene replacements. But one of the things that we have spent a lot of time doing is developing a method for really precisely controlling the production of any messenger RNA from any DNA template. And one of the 
places where we first discovered one of the main benefits of doing this over the current methods of making drugs was in CAR-T. And what I will say CAR-T revealed to us is something we should all have in our head about the current drugs that are used, which is that the pharmaceutical industry has spent decades making drugs to inhibit things, small molecules, antibodies, and to inhibit things initially, bacteria and viruses, and then all sorts of things in cancer, and to hit it really hard so you're inhibiting to the max. But there are a whole load of drugs that are useful, GLP-1s, that, and as an example, which are agonists, right? And it's been quite hard to make drugs that are agonists because you have to make them long-acting because you want to have a big effect and you want to make them really strong. And what we discovered when we control these proteins in CAR-T and now with GLP-1 is that, in fact, when you're using agonists, whether it's peptides or receptors, you are actually switching by using agonists aggressively you're switching the effect off almost as much as you're switching them on. So if you deliver these agonists physiologically, low levels periodically, you massively improve efficacy. I'm going to ask you about that in a moment. Simri. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Simrit Parmar. Um, I founded a company called Selenkos, which is based on regulatory T cells derived from umbilical cord blood. And what is very interesting about what we have developed is these cells can be frozen for a long period of time and can be modified to treat, to treat different types of diseases, including ALS. We have some very fantastic data in bone marrow inflammation, including aplastic anemia, and very excited to be here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Claire Mazumdar. I'm the CEO of a company called Bicar Therapeutics, based here in Boston. We're focused on bispecifics for targeted tumor modulation in solid tumors. Hi, PK Morrow. Nice to meet you all. I started this That's journey. P PK because nobody can pronounce her first name. Yes, you can just call me <laughs> pharmacokinetics. It's fine. Um, but uh, I started my, my journey in oncology at MD Anderson, where um, I was really honestly inspired by the journey and the, the, the achievements of Herceptin for breast, breast cancer. Then I moved from there to Amgen, was involved in the development of the first approved KRAS inhibitor, Sotorasib. Um, then moved to, to CRISPR, um, where I was the chief medical officer officer and, um, you know, proved what someone said, which was the fact that, you know, a person like Emmanuel Charpentier can both win a Nobel Prize and found a company. And then finally, delightfully, I am now for the past three months working at Takeda, where we're really advancing small molecules, monoclonal antibodies, as well as innate immunity. Great. So I'm going to ask Bruce a question. I'm going to ask everybody a question, but I want to start with Bruce. So Bruce is uh, uh, at the Mass General. He's in academia. And he's somebody that really saw the entire spectrum of what existed in, in the cancer field. And one of the new areas that's, I think, very exciting is ADCs. I think there's going to be far too many of them very shortly. But ADCs are changing the landscape of cancer therapy. What do you think about that? And I'm going to ask a second question of you, and that is, how do you think academic uh, uh, oncology departments fix the translation of uh, what people are working on? Well, maybe I'll answer the second first. Uh, I think in that uh, chart of the uh, biomedical environment in Boston that's been so productive, there was a, in the center of it was academic med medical centers. But I think the emphasis in talking about that was on discovery, which takes place there through NIH draw, uh, grants, philanthropy, whatever. But the central role of discovery for academic uh, institutions was emphasized. I'd like to also point out how important those academic institutions are in the development of drugs, and particularly in doing the clinical trials and translational research. I think that the success of the Boston scene is largely due to those centers, both in both roles, but particularly the, uh, the translational role and the, the clinical testing role and the, the faculty that comes from these universities 
cooperates with and at times moves into the biotech world. And I think that's an essential part of the success of, in Boston. And I know other countries are interested in trying to duplicate this. And the, the thing that they lack, it's not so much the discovery part, but it's the translational and the clinical part. Yeah, that's interesting. I think uh, academic institutions in New York ceased being important when Mark Tessier Levine left for Stanford. Yeah. But uh, is that yeah. true, Mark? Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not, right. I, I am not a believer uh, that, that yeah. the Cambridge and Boston uh, uh, ecosystem, uh, because we used that word before, is the uh, uh, be all of. Uh, no, of, I'm I, not either. Because I'm in New York. And we do it <laughs> well, I don't well. know about New York. I mean, <laughs> I'm not a Yankee fan. <laughs> but, okay, I, the I answer. Am. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> So uh, the first question about the ADCs. I, I have great enthusiasm for ADCs, and I'll tell you a bit about my personal involvement in this. In 1978, I had the privilege at NCI of putting into to the clinic a molecule that had great expectations. It was called metancine, yeah. and it, it was the uh, forerunner of Taxol. It failed in the clinic. It was too toxic. It was very active in animals, but it was much too toxic in people. So as a, a sort of a second place uh, winner, we put in the clinic Taxol, which proved to be a much more effective molecule with its problems. Uh, at the same time that I was doing that work on metancine, I was in the lab very interested in the folates and antifolates, and we were trying to determine how folates got into cells and in the process cloned something called the folate receptor. Um, it turned out it was important embryologically, but not in tumors and in uh, most uh, somatic tissues. And so uh, we felt we really had chosen the wrong molecule to work on. And, and the, it was a nice scientific article that came out of it, and, uh, but it was pretty much forgotten. 30 years later, somebody had the, the good sense to take metancine and ta attach it to antibodies to the folate receptor. And now we have an effective drug for ovarian cancer. Uh, Immunogen developed this uh, ADC just recently. It was approved, and the company was sold for $10 billion. So I feel like if I had a, a little more foresight, I would have been a rich man. But uh, yeah. Unfortunately, I didn't imagine that this could be possible. I think there's great future in this. I think we're just beginning, and uh, we're beginning to identify the right targets. It took us 10 years with antibodies in the clinic before we found a, an effective target, um, rituxan. And I think that we, at the moment, we just have a few targets that are useful for ADCs. They're more in development. Um, secondly, we only have really two classes of effective molecules, uh, drugs that are attached to the antibodies, uh, the antimitotics like metancine or orostatins and the topo-1 inhibitors. Yeah. And um, I'm sure that there are better molecules out there. And I've seen articles about things that I would love to see attached to antibodies uh, that are unique in terms of mechanism of action and have less toxicity. The, the ADCs have a great advantage. They deliver drugs selectively to tumors. We were never able to do that with chemotherapy. Immune, immune uh, approaches do that, but the combination of a, a drug attached to an antibody is really unique. The second thing it does is it gives us a, a, a long-term exposure for drugs, and that is very important for the uh, topo-1 inhibitors. We were never able conveniently to do that with topo-1 inhibitors as single molecules. But So the ADCs really have uh, significant advantages. The third thing is this, this uh, bystander effect. The, the, the free drug inside the cell is released, and we're not really uh, always a, a, a understanding of why that occurs in some cells and not others, but it does kill nor no, uh, neighboring cells and in the environment of, of the, uh, the cells that have taken up the antibody. So it's, it's really a, an early day in terms of understanding how these things work, but I think they have tremendous possibilities. And so I'm looking forward to seeing more antibody, different targets, different, different payloads. 
go into the clinic. And then the final thing is no single drug is going to cure cancer. I think combinations of drugs are, are uh, ADCs is part of the combinations. And I will say this, it is, I think, likely to replace chemotherapy um, in, in a major way or in the future. Yeah, one of these days. I mean, I think that the ADCs in, in, in China itself, I was uh, there a few weeks ago, and there were something like uh, 35 companies working on novel ADCs, and it's going to be interesting. And ADCs are important. Not everyone gets them right, but they're very, very important for the future of uh, cancer therapy. So I'm terribly excited about them as well. I'm also excited about uh, CAR-Ts. I'm going to predict something. Not for lupus erythematosus. <laughs> it's like bullshit stuff. So I'm very uh, outspoken. I'm telling you right now, it's not going to work. But where CAR-Ts are important, and we've seen it with, uh, uh, as I said, with myeloma, we've seen it with a, <clears throat> with a lot of liquid tumors, and they are important. People are trying solid tumors. I don't know whether it will be successful. We might be. But uh, uh, the CAR-Ts are important. And Sandy, why don't you tell us what you guys are doing with CAR-Ts? Um, so as I mentioned before, we can now control the um, production of any protein uh, delivered in any way. So you put a DNA template in, which is uh, exactly what's done when you make CAR-T. And we did this, and we knocked in our control cassette to the anti-CD19 CAR-T that's approved. The Carl June construct is actually the one we used. And head-to-head -head in primary human T cells, if you can control with an oral small molecule exactly the amount of CAR and the timing of CAR, so it goes on and off, you completely transform what those CAR T cells look like. They no longer look like they have a CAR. For example, you manufacture them without the CAR on. It's just not even there. And when you look at those cells, they have the phenotype of an untransduced T cell, yeah. a naive T cell. And when you look at all the different markers and you look at exhaustion markers, they're all identical to the mock controls which is great. They look like a mock T cell, behave like a mock T cell. Then, when you look at how they proliferate, they continue to proliferate. Unlike the approved CAR T, which peters out, these continue to proliferate exactly like the naive stem cell. And when you then test them in vitro against your target, in this case CD19, but we've done it with HER2, we've done it with multiple CARs actually for solid tumors, they work four times better. Then when you put them in vivo, you need a quarter of the number of cells to wipe out the tumor head to head with the improved car. So by controlling the timing of your receptor in a way that doesn't have it tonically on, you actually are able to massively increase the efficacy, decrease the dose, and improve the manufacturing of car. And that's one thing you can do. But in addition to that, when we look at treating solid tumors, you have many cases where when you infuse T cells that have a receptor that's targeting the cancer, it, they hit the lung before they even get to the cancer. And it's a really, but we can keep the car off and then you give the small molecule a week later, two weeks later, when they're resident in the tumor and fourfold more potent CAR T's light up and kill the tumor. So this is something that we found as a general finding in controlling the levels of receptors and agonists. But it was particularly strong when we looked at it in CAR. Very and cool. and it it's, has a significant, not minor effect on efficacy. Exciting. Claire, you guys are making bifunctional uh, antibodies. One of them uh, is an antibody, uh, uh, or is a target that I discovered and made a great drug with long ago. But how does it work better when you get uh, that second antibody in there? Even though we heard today that there's these, you know, distal pathways that stop a lot of the activities. 
I think it's playing off of something Bruce said. We think about the space of ADCs, you think about combination therapies. You know, the bispecifics to me is just the next step after ADCs. We think about tolerability and toxicity. Here we're delivering, in this case, TGF beta inhibitor, which is a different type of payload, directly with, you know, still maintaining the functionality of an EGFR inhibitor like cetuximab. And the concept here is, you know, cancer has always been smarter than, than anything, so we're trying to really remodel the tumor microenvironment. Well, it's smarter than some of the people working on it, but it doesn't mean the cancer is Exactly. Smarter. And, you know, by delivering, in this case, a, you know, immunomodulating payload right. directly to the tumor, we're seeing really impressive results. But uh, to me, it's all about the combination. It's the underlying biology, in this case, of the TGF-beta and EGFR yeah. pathways really synergizing to in, go after these immunosuppressive tumors. Yeah, I think that, that is exciting, and I think it's all part of, you know, Vince DeVita, who was my mentor at the NCI and uh, a good friend, uh, Vince taught us long ago that it was combination chemotherapy and, you know, really uh, used it. But one of the things that we're learning now is it's just as important to use those combinations outside of the chemotherapy field, maybe with or without it, and it'll be really cool. PK, Takeda is doing a slew of stuff. What's the most exciting, you know, you're working on small molecules, you're working on antibodies. Not always the smartest ones, but you're working on them. <laughs> Tell us what you're most excited about, because you've done a, a plethora of work in the field. Well, maybe I'll, you know, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I'll start with one. I think, you know, the first part is I'm really still quite excited about what the future holds for immuno-oncology. I think you've heard on the stage today, you know, and, and truly witness, right, what Kate Truda and with what the CAR T's have done Absolutely. for patients. And, you know, last, last year I remember going to the AXSL uh, presentation and hearing about the fact that, you know, they achieved overall survival benefit despite crossover and just thinking what that meant for patients, right? And so I think, you know, along that line, you know, we, we've done and made a deep investment in innate immunity. So really looking at how the Gamma Delta platform as well as the NK platform can really potentially, it has the potential to improve patients' lives. I'm really excited about that and also excited about the, the fact that we can, we need to further look at how we can employ, as, you know, my background um, entails, you know, gene editing to further, you know, improve that platform. So that's one. And, and I agree with you, Sam. I think the other element is there are tried and true modalities, many of which you, you know very well, that if we can appropriate leverage, and I'm sorry to tell you this, but, you know, machine learning and, <laughs> and artificial intelligence to, to better understand the responders. No, I believe in that now. The I'm responders. A real believer. Just so we Fantastic. Know. Uh, the responder <laughs> signatures and others, you know, to, to really continue to accelerate development. And the third thing I just want to say is, you know, just across the industry, I think, you know, we heard uh, the, the recent DAC about the, the agreement on, you know, MRD as a surrogate endpoint. Yep. And having been involved in those conversations over the period of, you know, a decade, it's really exciting to hear and to feel the excitement of the potential for additional surrogate endpoints to accelerate development in yeah. oncology. I mean, I think one of the big hurdles for us in the field is the regulatory agency still living 50 years ago sometimes, instead of living today and figuring out how to maneuver things properly. But that's a, a, a different uh, set of issues. Uh, Samrit, uh, you're, you were at MD Anderson. Uh, you see, you know the field of, of myeloma, and one of the exciting things is that the FDA recently looked at mineral residual disease in myeloma as something finally important. How do you view that, and what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, I think that's really transformational, and I can tell you, I have seen as a fellow when myeloma was being treated with thalidomide, and then when Revlimid came by. And then came Carfilzomib's, Carfilzomib's approval based upon a phase two trial, and the whole world was like up in arms. But here we are today, and I think hats off to Ola Langren's group and the initiative that they took. They have really transformed the thought process. You know, we used to call number needed to treat, and they have made uh, time needed to treat. Because by creating these yeah. amazing, deep, um, 
responses, MRD negativity based upon very solid data, meta-analysis, rigorous statistical evaluations, I think they have made a very strong case that these kind of deep responses of MRD being negative at 12 months having sustained negativity translates into real endpoint of overall survival and progression-free survival. And I think to utilize these kind of endpoints for accelerated approval really does a service to our patients. And you know, I just want to remind you that even with all these improvements, myeloma still is an incurable disease. The response rates or the survival rates are still around 60% or so. And yes, there are amazing CAR T cell therapies that are out there, but the side effects are pretty, pretty phenomenal. Yeah, but the, we're, so, we're keeping myeloma patients alive for yes. about a decade, which yep, is yep. about a decade longer than we could keep them alive before. And that's one of the exciting things about the field of cancer therapy, in that the world of biotech has played in the cancer world in a way that it didn't play in anything else yet. We're doing that. I'm doing that. Uh, but uh, what, it's terribly, terribly exciting. So now I, I, I uh, need to uh, move forward because Karun's you giving. Ask uh, I, well, I'm not going to yet. <laughs> what, what, what I'm going to do is ask each of the panelists to tell us, because cancer is a cool area, what they're most excited about uh, uh, as they look in the next few years, not the next 20 years, but in the next few years. Uh, in the treatment of cancer. Bruce, start and then well, I'm come gonna, down. Yeah, I'll get a bit out of my own comfort zone, but I, I, I really think, well, obviously immunology has made the, the biggest difference in our field in the last 15 years. I think targeted therapies have been very important, but even more important has been immunology. And what I look forward to is a real understanding of how to use the immune system better. Um, we see significant toxicities from what we're doing. We're basically loading all sorts of T cells to, you know, stimulating T cell responses very indiscriminately. I think we have to better understand the T cell population, the subsetting of the T cell population, and, and how to use those subsets effectively without stimulating everything at once. Uh, T regs and C CD4s and CD8s and and whatever whatever exists in the body gets uh, turned on by what we're doing. So I I think that that's going to make a, a significant difference. The other thing is that we're going to learn how to use these things together, and that's going to be really important. I, it's been critical for check checkpoint in, inhibitors, as you pointed out, Sam, using it with chemotherapy. Virtually all all effective therapies do that Absolutely. now. Absolutely, but you know, remember that what we did uh, that Cooley didn't understand over 100 years ago was that uh, uh, the immune system looked at tumors as self. And the moment we get rid of the Tregs to allow tumors to, look, to be looked at as foreign is what gives us the side effects that are bad. And this is going to be something that 20 years from now we're still going to be talking about, but anyway. Sandy. Um, I think that for patients that what we've found in the ability to control any protein or receptor in T cells or any cells, I think that when you guys who understand these things a lot better than I actually look at exactly what you want a cell to do, we now have the technology to be able to give an orchestra of small molecules, and you can tell the immune system or certain cells in the immune system, go here, differentiate now, and respond in this way. And I think over the next 10, 20 years, we'll see a really bespoke way of controlling the immune system that you can actually benefit a lot more patients with complete cure through T cells. Great. So so um, I think cell therapy is probably something that is sensational. And uh, I started my career as a transplant physician, stem cell transplant, and now I'm in cell therapy with lymphoma myeloma. But I think in our lifetimes, we have seen um, a really transformational therapy in front of our eyes. But 
I do want to say uh, in defense of T-Rex cells, because I have a T-Rex cell therapy company, I think it's the most misunderstood cell because tumor T-Reg is very different compared to therapeutic T-Reg. And a T-Reg is not a suppressor cell, it's a regulator. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'll stop at that. It, and by the way, it regulates uh, the immune system. So uh, Dick Gershon years ago, so I've been, I'm so old that I remember everything in the field of immunology. And the guy that discovered regulatory T cells, he called them T suppressors, was Dick Gershon at Yale and, and Tomi Otada at the University of Tokyo. And they got what they did. So I think we're entering the age of the bispecific and the bifunctional. To Bruce's point, if we can marry targeted oncology and immunotherapy, I, we're gonna see a lot of Space. We had our first bispecific approval in oncology just last year. That's the next Very few cool. years. Well, you know, uh, just taking a little history, you may even remember this. So, you know, when I was. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I like you, Sam. Um, so, um, so, when I was. See Ander that, Stelios? <laughs> just want to teach you something. <laughs> when, when I was at Anderson, Peter Rabden uh, published a, right. a, a, a publication in, in JCO, yeah. and it was about. For what benefit, what percent benefit would breast cancer patients take chemotherapy, intensive chemotherapy? That benefit was 1%. Yeah. They would take chemo for a 1% benefit. That's because Halstead showed that <laughs> nothing worked way back when. Yeah, yeah. It, and I think, you know, to be honest, just thinking about where we are now, it, it, it is truly unbelievable. And, and I think along the lines of this panel that we can really revel continue to advance cancer therapy by really targeting the T-cell through by specifics, through or, CARS, or, or, and or also innate through innate immunity. immunity. Yeah. Um, but by the way, just so you all know, IL-17 expands NK cells and CD8 T effector memory cells. It does both, and it does it beautifully. <laughs> Questions from the audience? And if I can't answer them, somebody here can. That's supposed to make you laugh. Any questions? No questions on oncology? It's because you don't have any oncologists. Okay. That near guy right there behind. Yeah. yeah, hi. So we talked about the CAR T cell treatment. We talked about the bispecific antibody. But uh, recently we saw the TIL. Keep, keep the microphone yeah. in your mouth. Okay, sorry. So we talked about the CAR T cell therapy, which has been successful in uh, hematological malignancies, but not in the solid tumor. We talked about the bi-specific uh, antibody. But the new cell-based therapy, the tumor infiltrating lymphocyte, which has shown success yeah. in melanoma, Exciting. is that going to be the next generation therapy for no. uh, solid tumor? No, but I'll tell you what is a real issue with it. Now I'm gonna let PK answer the question. <laughs> One of the things is going to be cost, because it costs a fortune to do that, and is going to cost and, and be too expensive for uh, um, uh, the payer to deal with. What do you think about it? <laughs> I, I, I don't think I have not exactly the same view as you, Sam. I, I think we have to follow the science, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> you know, I think, there, to be honest, looking at that data, it, it was actually very intriguing. Yeah. So I, I'm actually not saying no to that. That's Stevie Rosenberg's lifetime uh, uh, work, and it's great. I, um, I would like to add to it. I think tails are really interesting because they're opening a new field. And I think even the successes may not be spectacular, but it is leading us to some way because solid tumors are pretty pathetic, especially the ones who are relapsed refractory. Yeah. So, you know, I think, I think it's, it's here to stay. Probably it's generation 1.0, and we'll see more advancements. We're going to have to deal with costs one day in cancer, and we have to deal with it properly. And it's difficult, and we also have to deal with the fact that we have to understand how much something is going to cost to be manufactured in order to deal with that. Not easy. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. So my question is kind of a little different. It's not so much about oncology, but we've talked for some time now, many years, about how neurodegenerative diseases are like oncology in many ways. 
but we've not been able to extrapolate the successes that you've had in oncology to this area of disease. Progression-free survival, uh, you know, limiting clinical decline for a few months or two years isn't considered adequate by regulators, by kind of the drug development paradigm, although patients will tell you otherwise. I think we are seeing a big move. I think we're seeing a very big move, and I'm very excited about that and very encouraged. The problem is that we don't have 20 years that you've had to yeah. get to this point. So my question for you is, what is your advice to other therapeutic areas? Because we can't emulate everything, and no. we cannot do it in the way, the stepwise manner that you've done it so successfully. So what is your advice looking back? So I'm the only one here working on both neuro and, and, and now I'm joking, I'm not the only one. But one of the things that's very important is that we know that uh, for, uh, uh, for AD, that you can pinpoint the spot in the entorhinal cortex where it begins and begins to spread. We have no idea why. Everybody has a different reason. One is a virus, one's bacteria, one's mutation, probably all of them but we don't understand etiology of disease. And that's true in neuro, where we did understand a lot of the etiology of disease, all the way from P53 to uh, uh, the immune system and cancer. And that's a real difference. It isn't the same. I, I have something to say. I think... Okay. Done. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>